everyone, welcome back to the Study Tube Project. I'll just do a quick introduction for those of you who don't know me. I'm Paige and I have a YouTube channel called Paige Y and I am just about to graduate university, which is quite scary. I have just finished a degree in natural sciences specialising in astrophysics. And today I'm going to be talking to you about pulsars. To start off with, we all need to know what a neutron is. Hopefully most of you have heard of neutrons before. They are subatomic particles, they have no electric charge, and they are present in the nuclei of atoms. Now, we all know what stars are, the twinkling things in the night sky, the sun is a star itself. Stars can have different masses. We denote the mass of our sun as one solar mass where this is solar mass. One solar mass is the mass of our sun. In kilograms, this is about two times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Very, very, very massive. Now, today we are interested in stars with masses between 10 solar masses and 29 solar masses. As far as stars go, these are pretty big stars, much more massive than our sun, although they're not the most massive of all stars. You get more massive stars than this, but we are only considering this range because this range of stars ends their lives as a neutron star. Neutron stars are very, very dense bodies composed almost entirely of neutrons, as the name would suggest. These neutrons are packed very, 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 very close together. The typical spacing between each neutron is about 10 to the minus 15 metres, which is approximately the size of an atomic nucleus tiny. Gravitational forces are obviously acting on this neutron star, so the force of gravity acts radially inwards. However, a force called neutron degeneracy pressure acts outwards. The inwards forces are balanced by the outward forces, so the neutron star is in a stable state. Before we go any further, I want to talk to you about electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation is just waves of the electromagnetic field that propagate through space carrying energy. Electromagnetic waves are transverse, which means they look like what you imagine a typical wave. When someone says, draw a wave, you draw this wavy line. This is what a transverse wave looks like. So yeah, just imagine a wave like this carrying energy through space. Electromagnetic waves have a wavelength, which is defined as the distance from one peak to the next peak, or from one trough to the next trough. This distance here, or equivalently, this distance here is called the wavelength. Electromagnetic waves of different wavelengths form an electromagnetic spectrum. I have just done a really bad drawing of long wavelength slowly transitioning into short wavelength, which is supposed to be representative of the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is divided up into different classes depending on wavelength. So for example, the longest wavelength electromagnetic waves are called radio waves. And there is also a section of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is the visible section. And electromagnetic waves in the visible region of the spectrum are what people commonly refer to as light. Light is what's shining on me at the moment. It's what enters our eyes and allows us to view the world. <laughs> light is electromagnetic radiation. In astronomy, we get most of our experimental data from electromagnetic radiation. We can't travel out to stars ourselves to take some samples and check what's actually inside. We have to rely on electromagnetic radiation emitted from stars that we can then receive in our telescopes. And you might be wondering why is all this relevant? Let me tell you. Pulsars are rapidly rotating neutron stars from which we detect pulses of electromagnetic radiation. Remember, neutron stars are what we talked about at the start, the really dense remnants of massive stars which we find at the end of their lifetimes, while electromagnetic radiation is just electromagnetic waves propagating through space, carrying energy. 
Okay, so here we have our very dense neutron star. It is rapidly rotating, as I just mentioned. So I have drawn its rotation axis here and it's rotating around this axis. So just imagine it whizzing around really, really fast. A spinning sphere in space. But their magnetic axis is usually set at an angle to the rotation axis. So here I have sketched our rotation axis vertically upwards. Then we have the magnetic axis of the neutron star at an angle to the rotation axis. We've got the north and the south pole here. Now, due to mechanisms that we're not going to go into, the neutron star emits electromagnetic radiation along its magnetic axis. So we can think of a steady beam of electromagnetic waves traveling outwards from this neutron star along the magnetic axis in either direction. So there's a beam traveling this way and a beam traveling this way. However, remember the neutron star is rotating about its rotation axis. And as the neutron star rotates, these beams are going to sweep around. If the rotation axis is vertically upwards, one of the beams is coming out in this direction. As it rotates, the beam is gonna go like this. But now we start to think about when we're going to observe these electromagnetic waves. We will only be able to see these beams if our line of sight is aligned along the beam axis, more or less. So imagine the Earth very far away. Here's us on the Earth and we're looking at this neutron star. We've got our telescopes trained in the direction of this neutron star but we will only see the neutron star when this electromagnetic radiation is pointing in our direction. Now in this state, as I've drawn it, yes, the beam is pointing right at us, yay. But this beam is gonna turn around. We know this is rotating. So the beam is actually going to move around and sweep away from our line of sight. But it's eventually gonna come back around again and again coincide with our line of sight. So what happens is the beam is going to periodically pass through our line of sight. This means that we don't observe a steady beam of electromagnetic radiation, but rather we see pulses of electromagnetic radiation. Every time the beam cuts through our line of sight, we detect a pulse of electromagnetic radiation. To help understand this, you can think of a lighthouse. A lighthouse emits a light which sweeps around as it rotates. And so when you view a lighthouse from a large distance away, it just appears like a flashing light. Those flashes that we see from the lighthouse are just like the pulses that we observe from a neutron star. So yeah, when looking for neutron stars, we would just expect to view pulses of electromagnetic radiation coming from a fixed point in space. The existence of neutron stars was first hypothesized in 1934. However, it wasn't until 1967 that the first pulsar was detected. In 1967, a graduate student at the Cavendish Laboratory at the University of Cambridge called Jocelyn Bell Burnell was doing a project where she was using a radio telescope, that is a telescope that was detecting electromagnetic waves at radio wavelengths. And with this telescope, she detected those periodic pulses. And at the time she thought to herself, what is this interference? What is this signal that I'm getting from my telescope? It wasn't what she was expecting to see. It was eventually decided that these pulses she observed was the first pulsar to ever be detected. However, her supervisor, Tony Hewish, actually got the credit for this discovery. He was awarded the Nobel Prize a few years later, which was very controversial because at the time he was very sceptical about these pulses Jocelyn Bell Burnell was detecting. He scoffed at her. He thought it was some man-made interference, but she persisted and she was right. And she didn't get the Nobel Prize for physics. Her supervisor got the prize. She was just a graduate student at the time. She did say though that she felt the right decision had been made by the Nobel Committee. She reasoned that supervisors often have to take responsibility for their students' failures. So it only makes sense that they should be able to take responsibility for their students' successes too. I personally feel bad for her, but 
okay. Now let's discuss the life of pulsars. The period of a pulsar, which we will denote P, is the time it takes for the neutron star to make one complete rotation. We're also going to consider the rate of change of the period of the neutron star. We can think of this as how fast the neutron star is spinning up or spinning down. And we will denote this rate of change of the period of the pulsar as P dot. A very important graph in the study of pulsars is a graph of p dot against p, a graph of the rate of change of period against the period. The period of a neutron star increases in time generally. This means the neutron star rotates more and more slowly as time goes on. And that's purely because it is losing energy. It's losing lots of energy as electromagnetic waves. Energy must be conserved, energy can't be created or destroyed, and so the neutron star must lose kinetic energy energy due to an object's motion. Therefore, it starts to move slower, it rotates more slowly. Neutron stars are born, they start their life with a very short period. That means they're rotating very quickly because it takes a short time for them to complete one rotation. But as we said, their periods are going to increase in time. So their evolution on this graph is going to look a bit like this. Initially, they have a constant spin down rate, a constant P dot. However, eventually the spin down rate decreases. So we see P dot decrease. Eventually we reach a point where the neutron star is rotating quite slowly, its magnetic field has weakened and the pulses become too faint to detect. At this point, we say it's entered the graveyard zone. Here we have it the graveyard zone. <laughs> and yeah, pulsars in the graveyard zone are not detectable. I think I'm going to stop there for today because I think I've gone on long enough. But thank you for watching. Please give the video a like if you enjoyed it. I find astrophysics so exciting and I hope some of you guys do too. If you'd like to see more from me, please do go check out my own YouTube channel and my socials, which I will put in the description. Make sure you're subscribed to the StudyTube project Stay tuned to learn lots more in lots of different areas. There's so many varied videos going up on this channel. And yeah, see you later. Bye!